for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Lauren Lozier and I am the Associate Director in the Office of Alumni and Family Engagement. I am thrilled to have the opportunity to welcome um, each of you for this special edition reunion back to school class featuring Vic Fleming class of 1973. Before we get started, I want to go over a few Zoom keeping items, even though I know that you all are very well versed. First of all, all participants have been muted and we ask that you remain muted throughout the event. If you are comfortable and have not changed your Zoom name to your first and last name, we ask that you do that now. You can rename yourself by clicking on participants button at the bottom of your screen, hovering your mouse over your name and then clicking on the more button. Feel free to add your Davidson class here if you have one as well. The chat fe feature will be available. If you have questions for Vic during the Q&A period at the end of this presentation, please send them through the chat um, feature to me or my colleague, Judith Rolls. Vic, uh, Vic will not be monitoring the chat, so please do not send questions directly to him. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible, including the ones sent ahead of today's program via the Google Doc. For optimal viewing, we recommend hovering your mouse at the top of the black Zoom screen and you will see view pop up. If you click on that and then select side by side speaker view, you'll be able to see the PowerPoint in the center of your screen and the speaker, also known as Vic, to your right. In addition, we have enabled the live audio transcription for this call. If you would like to enable this on your end, you can hover over the live transcription button on your screen and subtitles should appear. Please note that the, the captions are not always accurate, so we ask for grace and understanding with this. If you have a tech issue, please send a chat to either myself, Lauren Lozier, or Judith Rolls. Now for our speaker. Victor Fleming, class of 1973, has been a judge in Little Rock since 1997. Between 2003 and 2021, he taught law and literature at the Bowen School of Law. Between 1993 and 2016, he wrote a weekly legal humor column. He is the author of two books of legal humor and author and co-author or editor of several collections of crossword puzzles. His crosswords have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Games Magazine, and many other venues. Please welcome to our virtual stage, Judge Vic Fleming. Crossword puzzles are a lot like life. You start out clueless. Before you know it, you pick up your first words. When you have a success, you build on it. When you make a mistake, you learn from it. You discover that everything is connected to everything else. And in the end, it doesn't matter if you have a few empty spaces here and there, as long as it all adds up to something. And having said that, we now, I need to kick in the screen share and show you what I thought you were looking at all along. And so there you have it after I've recited it. And I apologize, but all the, all the miscues are now out in the open. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for that uh, nice introduction. And I wanna thank Lauren Lozier and Judith Rolls both for the extra hard and tough work that they've done to make tonight's event a reality. I also wanna thank the members of the 50 year reunion committee uh, this will take a second. Skip Ald, Rusty Boyd, Paul Caldwell, Sandy Carnegie, Dick Clay, Bob Dawson, Mike Dees, Keith Bell, Joe Finch, Lewis Galloway, Craig Harris, Mike Kelly, Rob Krebs, Bill Lawing, Gardner Rollo, I mean, La Gardner Roller Ligo, uh, Scotty Sheftal, Steve Suplis, Carl Patterson, Carl Rizzo, Bob Robinson, Rick Whitener, Gray Wilson, Rich Wilson, and Rusty Winchester. And I know I saw some of those folks uh, coming out of the... Uh, uh, the holding room just a few minutes ago. Uh, I'm always honored to be able to share with a group, especially a group from Davidson College, uh, my passion for cruciverbalism, the art of making and solving crosswords, uh, the ultimate tool in creative wordplay. Speaking of creative wordplay, I'm in year 27 as a high volume district court judge. 
uh, with mostly traffic cases, and it has never ceased to be an educational experience in the area of language. At least 50 people over time have told me that the reason they were speeding is that their vehicle had a broken speed thermometer. A different group of 50 people or more have said that on the very day that they had their traffic accident, their liability insurance coverage had collapsed. A smaller, but still not insignificant number, when asked the simple question that everyone anticipates in court, how do you plead, have responded, your honor, I just wanna throw my mercy on the court. The, uh, the poem I began with was written as prose by my dear friend, the late great Merle Regal, a major player in the modernization of the American crossword puzzle, proudly proclaiming himself to be second banana only to Will Shorts at the New York Times. Merle was a comedian, a, cross, a musician, and a self-employed crossword puzzle constructor. He wrote the Sunday crossword puzzle for the San Francisco Examiner for many years and single-handedly syndicated it to uh, dozens of papers across the country. And about once a year, with the help of his better half, Marie, he would publish uh, his puzzles in book form. And with lots of help from Marie, they would market them and he was quite successful at it. In 2005, Merle was a source of inspiration for the following song. The pay or play extender is Ola, not Ole. And it's anti that you want, not anti, when the clue is paid to play. You can edit out, add it on your IBM, Hula on Maui with Tiny Tim, but if you don't come across, I'm gonna be down. Well, it's Este, not Estes, if you want the cosmetics queen. And Eilis Artie is a Johnson scene on the TV screen. Lou is a John on the British Isle. Ryan and Cole both ran the mile. And if you don't come across, I'm going to be down. If you don't come across, I'm going to be down. If you don't come across, I'm going to be down. Your love to me is a mystery, and the clues are all around. If you don't come across, I'm going to be down. You're an easy fill on Mondays. But when the weekends come, your themeless open spaces make me feel so dumb triple stacks absurdities pop culture and obscurities if you don't come across i'm gonna be down now everybody if you don't come across i'm gonna be down right there in your zoom space sing it out if you don't come across i'm gonna be down your love to me is a mystery and the clues are all around Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, before saying a little more about that song, uh, let's go back in time a ways. The ancestor of today's American crossword puzzle is the word square. A word square is an informal grid containing words of the same length arranged so that each word appears twice, once horizontally, and once vertically, and it can work for words of any length. Um, word squares were found in several areas of ancient Europe, including the ruins of Pompeii, where some were evidently written as early as the first century of the Common Era. The most famous word square unearthed in um, uh, 
Pompeii was one that was called the Seder Square or the Seder Acrostic. Um, it's believed to date from the year 62 Common Era AD. It has five Latin words that appear not just twice, but four times each, twice in the correct order and twice in the reverse order. Read as a sentence translated as the sower Arepo guides the wheels with care, it has received uh, some Christian mystical significance. Uh, just a quick footnote, scholars are not sure what Arepo really was, and some have speculated that it may be a made up word uh, to, just to fill in the, uh, the word square, which would be a total violation of modern crossword principles. Uh, not but it's not surprising that it has this religious significance, given that if you anagram it, you can come up with the first two words of the Lord's Prayer with Alpha and Omega left over. And if you anagram it a little differently, you can come up with a, um, with a, with a short prayer uh, with a, a little stylistic redundancy. But word squares are pretty good evidence that human beings have been playing with this concept of putting words into a grid for educational and humorous, playful reasons um, for a good long while. Plus, they were definitely the precursors of uh, modern day crossword puzzles. Uh, the history of modern crossword puzzles, December 21st, 1913 is a key date. That is when the New York World newspaper, whose Sunday fun page editor was a guy named Arthur Wynn, uh, who no doubt would have been familiar with word squares, published something that he had written and which he called uh, a word cross puzzle with a capital W and a capital C and a hyphen in between the two words. Uh, on the second week of this first uh, of this new project, and it was immediately popular with the readership of the New York World, but on the very second week, a typesetter uh, put a caption where the title, you might would have expected the title to be, put a caption, can you fill in the crosswords uh, with a capital C and a capital W, a space between the two and no hyphen. Uh, and then in the third week, uh, whatever the caption was, it was, re it, it was called a cross hyphen word puzzle. So it was unclear the first three weeks what they were really trying to call this thing, but apparently cross words got the, um, got, got the best reader response. And so they began to call it a crossword puzzle. Uh, I asked Will Shorts, my friend, uh, who's the puzzle editor of the New York Times about this, and he said there was always a hyphen between cross and word in the early days after this puzzle was created. Um, and he said that 1927 was the year that Webster's New International Dictionary admitted the word crossword to the dictionary um, without a hyphen, uh, thus making it official that it was to be one word. Um, if you're picky about that sort of thing, stick with me uh, for a few more slides and I'll have another little story for you. But you can see this grid is in a diamond shape and it has unchecked squares in the, uh, the absolute north, absolute south, absolute east and absolute west points on the grid. Um, let's just say that there was some experimentation in the weeks that followed. Um, and uh, rectangles and squares run one out over circles, diamonds, and other uh, uh, shapes that might have been in uh, participation. Um, so the world had its, the, the, the New York world syndicated its puzzles to papers around the country, and they had pretty much a lock on the crossword industry for about a decade. And then in 1924, Carly Simon's father, Richard, and his friend Lincoln Schuster, whose nickname was Max, uh, formed a publishing company. You may have heard of this publishing company, Simon and Schuster. Their first book uh, in April of that year was a collection of New York World crosswords, and they titled the book The Crossword Puzzle Book with no hyphen. 
and apparently a space between cross and word. And actually, if you look in the in the book itself, it has, in addition to crosswords, it has some funny little dialogue and jokes and a few things like that. But all through the book, cross and word are separate uh, words with no hyphen. Um, the the uh, it's interesting story they put they called themselves Plaza Publishing uh, in the interior of the book uh, and the story as the story goes they were afraid being a new company that uh, if the best they could do was a collection of crossword puzzles and that didn't work they might be out of business in a hurry well the 3600 uh, first printing sold out in less than a week and they then issued a second series and they did more copies of it and they did a third series and a fourth series and in 1924 the crossword puzzle book grossed over six hundred thousand dollars uh, and that was a lot of money in 1924. Uh, we do indeed start out clueless and when we have a success we build on it. Simon and Schuster never used a hyphen uh, in their word crossword but uh, and as late as 1950, they were still putting a space between cross and word, but they did ultimately catch up uh, or catch on. And uh, they've published at least one book of crossword puzzles every year since the fir firm was uh, organized. And they are now doing a, a couple of uh, 300 puzzle books per year called Simon & Schuster Mega Crossword Puzzle Book. Uh, crossword puzzles became a fad during the Roaring Twenties, even without the support of the New York Times, which famously or infamously, in a November 1924 editorial, referred to crosswords, calling them a, quote, primitive sort of mental exercise and a, quote, sinful waste of time. <laughs> uh, 18 years later, in 1942, the New York Times hired Simon & Schuster's crossword editor, a woman who, when she went to work for Simon & Schuster's name was Margaret Petherbridge, and she got married to a guy whose last name was Ferrer. So Margaret Petherbridge Ferrer became the first crossword editor of the New York Times in 1942. The Times started publishing Sunday papers, papers only, and then eight years later, they would go to running uh, daily puzzles as well as Sunday puzzles. But it's interesting, the editor has said that the editors and publishers of the New York Times loved working crosswords and they were embarrassed to have to buy a copy of the New York World, a competitor, in order to work them. And with the United States getting into World War II after Pearl Harbor, some of them are said to have argued to the paper's owners that uh, people needed a diversion during air raid blackouts and what could be better than having a crossword puzzle and you know the new york times got into competitive business um but speaking of world war ii and uh deviating a little bit from the history of american crossword puzzles um there was what's known as the crossword panic of 1944. In early 1944, uh, over a period of several weeks, the United Kingdom's Daily Telegraph newspaper uh, crossword puzzle um, contained the words Juno, Gold, Sword, Utah, Omaha, Overlord, and Mulberry. Do you know what those words have in common? I can't see everybody, but raise your hand if you know what they have in common. Oh, yes, everybody knows what that is. All of those words were code words for places or things involved in the planned D-Day invasion. Well, five days out from the D-Day invasion, the word Neptune, another D-Day word, appeared and MI5 went into action. They decided this couldn't be a coincidence. So it sent two agents to the home of Leonard Daw, who was the headmaster of a place called the Strand School, the equivalent of what we would today call a middle school. And Daw moonlighted as one of two crossword compilers, that's what they called them in, uh, in England, uh, for the telegraph. And each of the puzzles in question had been written by Daw. Well, in 1958, when the BBC interviewed Dahl about this, and MI5 didn't publish, publicize what they were doing, 
but it somehow came to light 15 years later in 1958. And Daw said, quote, they turned me inside out and then they went to the home of my senior colleague, Melville Jones, and put him through his paces. But they eventually decided not to shoot us. And that was 1958, 14 year, 13 years after the war was over. And that's where the story stayed until 1984, when a guy named Roland French, a property manager in Wolverhampton, England, came forward and said that as a 14-year-old student of Mr. Daw, he had from time to time been detained in Daw's office and as a mental exercise was asked to fill in uh, blank grids that Daw would then later write the clues to. And he said that he, he and other kids had played around the, the edges of the schoolyard uh, which was an army camp that, that included uh, Canadian, Australian, and American soldiers. And they had picked up these code words there. Um, he also said further that shortly after D-Day, Daw, who had been interrogated by MI5, sent for me and asked me point blank where I had gotten the words. He said, I told him all that I knew and he made me swear on the Bible I would never tell anyone about it. I have kept that oath until now. And journalistic research would ultimately show that two other former Strand students came forward with essentially the same story, one four years before Daw and one about 11 years after Daw, with it having essentially the same story. So um, fast forward to 1977, a major development in crossword history. A 1974 Indiana University graduate named Will Shorts graduated from law school at the University of Virginia. He declined to take the bar exam and went to work instead for Games Magazine. In 1978, Will began or founded what is called what has been called the to, to this day the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. In 1992, while a, an assistant editor at Games Magazine. He interviewed Bill Clinton, who was then governor of Arkansas and a candidate for president of the United States. In 1993, Will would become the fourth puzzle editor of the New York Times. Um, when we have a success, we build on it. Uh, pictures of Will Shorts up in the upper left when he was first getting started at the Times, I believe. And then uh, that picture in the middle is myself and my wife, Marion, at last year's American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. Um, so at the uh, Crossword Tournament in 2005, I debuted the song that you heard a few minutes ago. And as it turns out, O'Malley Creedon Productions of Los Angeles happened to be on site at that puzzle tournament shooting footage for a documentary on crosswords. And I will tell you this again as a bit of a digression, everyone who heard that said, oh my God, even though we like crossword puzzles, can you imagine anything more boring than a documentary about crosswords? Well, O'Malley Creedon Production turned out to be two wonderful individuals, Christine O'Malley and Patrick Creedon, husband and wife, uh, who were in the film industry. She, as a producer, and she had been with that Enron movie earlier in uh, 2005, The Best and the Brightest, or The Brightest in the Room, something like that, the, the Enron story. And uh, Patrick had been a cameraman for several years. And for their 10th wedding anniversary, they gave themselves the present and a challenge to each other to do a, a feature-length uh, documentary about crossword puzzles, which they both loved. Well, they left me in the movie, in the movie, singing the song and licensed the song for use in the closing credits of that film. And as part of that routine, they had Christine's brother, a guy named Sean O'Malley, record the song. Um, Wordplay was accepted to the Sundance Film Festival uh, for two thousand in January for January of two thousand six where it was purchased by the Independent Film Corporation for about a million dollars, a little over a million. And then Wordplay grossed $3.1 million at the domestic box office in 2006 and received a 95% positive rating from Rotten Tomatoes, the highest rating of any film that year. Everything is connected to everything else. 
As for the song, when the credits start to roll, another song, Every Word, by an old country singer named Gary Lewis, plays in its entirety. And then when that song ends, the last 57 seconds of uh, Sean O'Malley's version of my song played to empty theaters everywhere because it was at the end of the credits. Everybody was looking for their car in the parking lot. Um, so uh, to the history of the, uh, the timeline, we add wordplay, uh, which I do recommend that you watch if you haven't watched it already, whether you're a crossword enthusiast or not, it polled well during film festivals uh, as well with people who didn't do crosswords as those who did. You can watch it on YouTube for $3.99. If you do that and don't like it, email me and I'll double your money back. Uh, moving forward chronologically, to uh, 2016, uh, a dark uh, moment in the world of crosswords. A software engineer by the name of Saul Quanson in Oregon created a computer program that he that uh, assembled a database of over 50,000 published crossword puzzles online, and it analyzed their content for similarities. He was doing this in an effort to, to teach himself how to make crosswords. And the data analysis from this program proved to be most unusual. Um, this was written about by Oliver Rader, whose name you see in this byline here, in an online publication called 538, which is a really good uh, publication, or it was. Uh, two categories of alleged impropriety came to light in this plagiarism scandal. Um, Rader referred to these as the shoddy and the shady. Uh, in one category were some 60 crossword puzzles published by Universal Syndicate or USA Today, who for the two, two venues that had the same editor, in which substantial similarities were noted in previous, in 11 to 12 year old New York Times crossword puzzles and a few other. Uh, puzzles from other venues, but mostly the New York Times. In the other category were some 900 or more instances in which puzzles that had been purchased by Universal or USA Today by this editor on the freelance market were run a second time four to seven years after their original publication date. And when they were run the second time, there were minor changes uh, and a different byline. The bylines all turned out to be pseudonyms created by this editor. Uh, so in the former group, it appeared the editor had ripped off the ideas and the infrastructure of previously published puzzles. In the second group, it appeared that he was running a second time puzzles that had been purchased uh, before without paying the uh, submitting person a second time. Uh, but though presumably getting paid himself a second time. But, you know, the real, the real bad aspect of that is that, um, is that just it appeared that there was just a major scheme to mislead and to maybe to make more money than uh, he should have been making. If you're interested in the details, uh, please uh, look up Oliver's uh, articles in 538. Um, well, the editor for USA Today and Universal lost his job altogether at USA Today. And at Universal, he was suspended for 90 days, then brought back. And a few months later, he retired. A fellow named Fred Piscop, who had for many years had been uh, the crossword editor at the uh, Washington Post, but had not worked there in a couple of years. Uh, Fred, uh, on recommendation from Will Shorts, was hired by Universal Syndicate to come in and fix things for, an, for, a for, for the foreseeable future, which wound up being about six to nine months, as I recall. Well, Fred asked me and two others, Frank Longo and Elizabeth Gorski, to join him in suddenly, immediately creating 14 new crossword puzzles a week uh, for these two venues. Uh, and so in the year 2016, I wrote about 60 crossword puzzles in 90 days toward the end of the year that had not been on my agenda earlier in the year. Uh, and that particular year, I was under contract to create 88 crossword puzzles for other venues. And so that was 
a very busy year for me as a result of the plagiarism scandal. Um, um, so let's put one more notch uh, on the timeline, that being the New York Times celebration of its own 75th birthday as a crossword venue. Um, what Will Shorts decided he would do to celebrate this milestone was uh, to have regular contributors pair up with celebrities who were known to really like the New York Times crossword and write uh, crosswords with them. The idea being that once a month for the year 2017, the Times would uh, run these puzzles with joint bylines. The celebrities included Jesse Eisenberg, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Lisa Loeb, Neil Patrick Harris, John Lithgow, Rachel Maddow, Weird Al Yankovic, and some others. In fact, they wound up having 15 consecutive months of joint bylines. I was asked to coordinate with and co-write a puzzle with Bill Clinton. Will knew that Bill and I had a history of solving themeless weekend New York Times puzzles together. And time doesn't permit me to give you the specifics on that, but Will's directions to us were to uh, to do a themeless puzzle with a political edge, quote unquote. Uh, and so this is what we did. And this puzzle ran in May of 2017, and I'm about to spoil it for you. So <laughs> spoiler alert, cluing each of three symmetrically placed answers as though they were not related to each other is in the category that the business calls an Easter egg. Uh, it's a theme that's not really clued as a theme, so it's considered to be hidden. Um, these, of course, as you're, the screen that you're looking at are lyrics from the Fleetwood Mac song that was uh, a theme song of the Clinton campaign in 1992, as well as uh, the first few years of the presidency. And those are the clues that we used for it. Um, but making, uh, making the puzzle with those three main entries allowed us to uh, use the word economy going down the very center of the puzzle and clued it, it's the blank stupid, which gave this uh, apparently themeless puzzle, uh, actually a, a, a full theme and a mini theme. Um, and I, all I know to tell you is that it is considered a good thing if really good crossword puzzle solvers don't recognize the hidden theme. And I've never gotten a more excited email from Will Shorts when he emailed me saying that all four of his of the New York Times regular test solvers, all four missed the, the, the theme in this one. So he was very happy about that. So uh, as it turns out, um, well, that's going to be it for crossword history. Uh, always get questions about how to make a crossword puzzle. So I'm going to give you like a three minute tutorial on how to make a crossword puzzle. There are four steps in crossword puzzle construction, theme development, grid construction, filling the grid and writing the clues. I'm going to ta take an old, um, an old boring theme that I did, but it's still one of my favorite themes uh, to show you how I developed the theme on this. I had the idea of making a crossword puzzle in which the theme answers would be recognized phrases, phrases that are recognized as being in the language, starting with each of the seven subject pronouns. So this involves seven different instances of brainstorming, thinking up as much as I can and also using online resources. And I came up with these, I came up with the first three. The fourth one I didn't come up with on the pronoun I, uh, on the pronoun we, I think I came up with two. Uh, on the pronoun you, I came up with these. And uh, on the he, he done her wrong, he got game. Um, oops, where'd that come from? I don't know what I just did. It looks like I may have just started the... Uh, the thing over. So I'm going to try to catch up here. Bear with me. All 
Okay, so, but having seven theme answers and a 15 by 15 puzzle, I was looking for short uh, phrases. And um, I wound up with this group, I can dream you again, it figures, they say she devils, we made it and he got game. Um, the grid construction is accomplished when you take the theme that you want to use and put it into a blank grid. You get extra points with an editor anytime you can cross theme answers as I was able to do with two pairs of theme answers here. Um, in uh, the black squares are called blocks, the white squares are called boxes. And as you place the black squares in the grid, you're asking, what have I forced myself into? You're looking to create opportunities to end words with, with friendly letters like, like E, D, Y, R, S, T, L, N, W maybe. You're, you're looking to not make yourself have to end anything with a Z or a Q or a J. Um, and uh, then you, you do a, a few test runs, figure, seeing if you can fit, do the fill. When you're doing the fill, we're trying not to, to use any obscure words. We're trying to use words that are fun and friendly and uh, accessible to everyone. Writing the clues, you always do it last, but truth of the matter is you, you like to do the, the clues on the theme answers first, just in case you have one that's really hard to clue. Uh, the theme answers here, shout upon reaching a destination, we made it, wouldn't that be nice, I can dream. Um, Spike, not, Spike Lee's movies were called joints, I don't know if everybody knew that or not, but 1998 Spike Lee joint, he got game. Uh, Wicked Women, She Devils, there'd actually been a, an old movie named She Devils, but uh, nobody really knew about it, but that that's an interesting word, it went to, from being uh, two words to being uh, one word non-hyphenated, and it was kind of difficult to do. Fortunately, you don't have to get the hyphenation in the uh, crossword puzzle. Uh, clue writing, I'll just say that a friend of mine, Patrick Merrill, an excellent crossword constructor, does a blog, and he has identified in his blog 24 separate rules for writing crossword puzzle clues. I'm not going to try to go over them with you, but the bottom line is you have to be pretty uh, accurate and uh, you have to be pristine in writing crossword puzzle clues. Uh, when I give those four steps, usually someone says, well, how do you do theme, con theme development on a puzzle that doesn't have a theme? Well, even a puzzle without a theme usually has a couple of long answers that are seed entries, two, maybe three, that have some special significance, just like we started that Clinton puzzle with um, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Uh, here's an example of a puzzle where Sammy Zersky and I in 2012 uh, did one and we started it with photo bucket and Google, uh, Google Earth. Sam, by the way, was a senior in high school in Alexandria, Virginia at the time. He went on to four years at University of Virginia and had the opportunity to go into to get a job on Wall Street in New York. Instead, he chose to be uh, an intern for Will Shorts, and he is now one of Will Shorts's four associate uh, puzzle editors. But Sam was someone I mentored in crossword construction. Um, people often ask me, people often tell me, I, I don't like crosswords because I don't have a very good vocabulary, or I, or I do crossword puzzles because I'm trying to strengthen my vocabulary. It doesn't seem to be working. Well, Will Shorts, I heard him say in a speech one time that a good crossword puzzle calls upon the solver's mental flexibility, sense of humor, problem solving skills, general knowledge, and last but not least, vocabulary. Um, so you don't really want, don't really shouldn't, shouldn't not do crosswords because of anything having to do with your vocabulary. If you're doing a crossword puzzle where you don't get some laughter and don't use some problem solving skills, you might wanna look around for uh, another puzzle. All right, I'm gonna give you a quick little story here and then we're gonna do a Q and A. Um, on July, the sometime in June of 2021, I called the uh, edit, editor of the Steamboat Pilot and Today Crossword Puzzle and asked if she would bump the 
the syndicated puzzle that they run every day and instead run one with my byline. It was a, it was a puzzle without a title, but these are the three key clues. Request a union, Swamp Fox Francis and union request. And I had already developed a practice with Marion, my wife, at that time, we were not married, and we worked the crossword puzzle usually every day together. And uh, those answers um, came out to be, pop the question, Marion, will you marry me? And she said yes, and we've been married for uh, almost 18 months now. And this is a mixed media artwork that I created to capture the actual uh, puzzle as we saw that in the paper, uh, this uh, piece is called Puzzling. Um, it's, you know, I'm not really an artist, but I've been inspired by her artwork. And I think somebody sent a question earlier asking me to give what my three favorite paintings of her, hers were, and that would be uh, Mystical Aspens, Ethereal Aspens, and the frog formerly known as Prince. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what that question was. That question was what my three favorite crossword puzzles were. I'm sorry, forget about those last three sides. Um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the movie wordplay, Bill Clinton was interviewed at some length about why he liked crossword puzzles. And he ultimately said, I don't know, they're fun. And that's uh, where we're gonna break for Q and A. So um, if you have questions for me, we've got uh, a while and I've asked uh, Judith and Lauren to um, to cut the Q&A off with about five minutes left in the overall thing because I like to close on a high note not a question that I can't answer. <laughs> well Vic thank you so much for joining us we will now share some questions that have come through via um, the chat feature if we have any as a reminder you can send your questions directly to me Lauren Lozier or Judith Rolls, we will do our best to have Vic answer as many questions as time allows. Judith, have you received any? I have not, but I think we can start also with the ones on the Google Doc. Absolutely. And you know what? We actually have one come from our colleague, Ruth Olson. So I will happily ask that. Um, she asked Vic, what is the longest word you have put into a puzzle? The longest word that I've put into a puzzle. Well, I tell you, uh, one of the questions that I got was my favorite all time puzzle. And uh, I couldn't to come up with one. I came up with three. And the third one is on point with her question, although it does not directly answer it. Um, my favorite all time puzzles was one by a guy named Jeremiah, Jeremiah Farrell that was published on election day 1996 in which um, by you know having the puzzle in on election day uh, the one of the answers was uh, headline in tomorrow's paper headline in uh, today's paper and it was blank elected and the blank could be Clinton or it could be Bob Dole and it was structured in such a way that it could be both because the downward answers were structured. And it was the first of what is known as a Schrodinger puzzle based upon uh, the P Schrodinger's paradox or the paradox of Schrodinger's cat. If you don't know what that is, look it up. It was a scientist who did an experiment, a hypothetical experiment with uh, decaying radioactivity in a box with a pet cat. And the question is the pet, the, the, the paradox is that the cat was both dead and alive at the same time. So uh, Schrodinger puzzle, uh, which I'm going to show you an example of, maybe if we have time, uh, either of two answers can be correct. Uh, the second puzzle, favorite of all time, there was a puzzle that my friend Patrick Merrill did once. It was a Thursday puzzle. And uh, one of the, the long answer in the puzzle that covered three answers was uh, what's hidden in this puzzle? Um, and the answer was a message in the letters of the clues. And then when you took the clues and you read the first letter of each clue and went downward, the answer was something like the good news is that you spotted the message. The bad news is this is all there is to it or something along those lines, which I thought was pretty clever. But the third, most fa the third famous puzzle of mine 
it's not that this is, these are the longest letters. This was a puzzle that I did with a guy named Joe Krozel. Uh, he, and this is a, 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 day, a, a Thursday New York Times puzzle, I think. But I think it holds the record for the, the most number of 15 letter answers uh, in a regular puzzle. And you can see the, um, the theme or legal themes, you know, the defense rest, capital offenses, admission to bail, court appearances. Those are all recognized legal phrases. Um, I, I don't, I can't remember the longest one. You know, puzzles run, puzzles run more toward phrases than long words because long words are often obscure and people don't know what they are. So I don't know what the longest word I ever put in a puzzle. Sorry to have to pass on that, but. Um, I am gonna just go directly to some of the questions, Vic, that have come through the chat. So the first one is from um, James Walker, class of 1990. And he um, asked um, about how long does it take, to, take you to complete a puzzle? Oh, to solve a puzzle? Is that, yep. uh, well, you know, New York Times puzzles, uh, are easy on Monday and they get progressively harder through the week. So on a Monday New York pu Times puzzle, I'm almost always done in under 10 minutes. Uh, Tuesday, closer to 15. Wednesday, 15 to 20. Thursday, 20 to 40. Fridays and Saturdays are the toughest and they're usually about a half hour. Um, and then on Sundays, I'm usually shooting to finish in 45 minutes or so. Um, and, so and I'm not, I'm, and let's let's get a good comparison on that. If I'm done with a Monday New York Times puzzle in under 10 minutes, I'm happy. The people who are in the A division of the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament are solving a Monday New York Times puzzle in under two minutes. That's under wild. two minutes. So I am not a speed solver. I'm not considered a speed solver at all. So um, from one of your classmates, uh, Rich Wilson, he would like to know what first got you interested in crossword puzzles? My mother got me started working crossword puzzles when I was maybe in the seventh grade. I remember seeing them in um, some, maybe the weekly, did we get something called the weekly reader uh, in uh, elementary school? And occasionally there'd be some kind of a crossword a puzzle. I remember starting to work them and my mother encouraged me to working them and I remember working them through high school and I remember working them at Davidson College. I would work the puzzle in the Charlotte Observer, not every day, but three or four days a week. So that was the impetus. Um, how do you decide on the block pattern, which always seems to be a mirror of itself? And that question comes from Charles Vogan. Well, yes, one of one of the rules that was developed by Margaret Ferrer when she started uh, doing the crossword at the New York Times, she came up with a comp with a comprehensive set of rules, and one of the first ones was that the the, uh, the the puzzle grids needed to be symmetrical, and the most common symmetry is what's called. Um, rotational symmetry so that the puzzle looks the same upside down as it does right side up. But there's there can also be left right symmetry or top bottom symmetry and there are even a few other kinds of symmetry but basically the rule continues to be that a puzzle grid needs to be symmetrical. Now there are puzzles out there, there are editors out there that are breaking that rule for their own reasons and uh, that's fine. Uh, and occasionally, uh, well, I, I don't think the New York Times is breaking it yet, but sometimes they'll have a puzzle that has symmetry that I have trouble figuring out where it came from. But uh, yeah, it's, so that's just one of the rules that came into being because it did. I gotcha. And so I should say also in a 15 by 15 grid, the general rule is that you can't have more than 38 blocks. Uh, an editor might allow you 40 or 42 if you've got a really good theme and it won't and you can't make it float with the 38. Uh, and that's about 16 percent of the uh, grid usually. Um, the, the standard daily puzzle has 78 uh, ma maximum of 78 answers. Sometimes it might be 76. And then the themeless puzzles on Fridays and Saturdays, they usually, have a maximum of 72, sometimes less. 
And there are some people who have competed over the years to try to be, be the leader, the one who has the, the puzzle with the fewest answers. And I don't really know who the leader is now, but there are some puzzles out there that maybe one uh, that was done by a guy named Manny Nosowski that had 58 answers. Um, and I think he's interviewed in one of the extra parts of the wordplay DVD explaining how he made that puzzle, so. Um, so from Roger, class of 1986, can the same puzzle easily vary in difficulty just by cluing it differently? Yes. Is this a way to get more puzzles per grid? Well, that is uh, the the difficulty of the uh, yes uh, the clues you can take you can take a a Monday New York Times puzzle and write erase all the clues and write harder clues and it'll be it'll be a harder puzzle that's exactly where but um, when when you get to puzzles that are intentionally more challenging than others the rules relax a little bit in terms of having uh, maybe two or three words or phrases that might be a little bit tricky, maybe be a little bit off the beaten path. But um, the solvers uh, express themselves when the puzzles are too hard, <laughs> never when it's too easy. <laughs> so. Um, so uh, Clara, who is actually class of 2024, um, they have submitted a question, which is which crosswords do you try and complete daily? Well, I do the New York Times puzzle every day. Uh, I used to do more than one a day before papers went online. Uh, the, 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 I used to do the Universal Syndicate puzzle every day because it was there, it was there in the newspaper and I, the, the, I like to just pull out a pen and work it. But the, uh, the interactive software that my paper uses for solving that puzzle now is just really um, inferior, I think. So sometimes I do, uh, uh, weeks will go by and I've done nothing but New York Times puzzles. But other times I'll, I'll see a puzzle or hear about one and I'll go out of my way to find it online and print it out. So, but the New York Times is the one I do most regularly. So also from Clara, class of 2024, um, do you have any advice and tips for creating crossword puzzles? Well, the four steps that uh, the little tutorial that I gave would, would have most of my advice. Uh, I will say this, um, the, the New York Times and other puzzle uh, venues that accept puzzles, uh, they're looking for stuff that's never been done before. They're looking for creativity, and so if you have if you happen upon a theme where you you know you're going to want uh, four answers of between the, the the lengths of nine and eleven letters, and I say nine to eleven because once you get a twelve letter word involved, there are places in the puzzle that it can't go. Uh, you can't you really use a twelve letter word on lines three and uh, and thirteen which are important lines in making themes. But if you're going to do a theme, I, I, if you want to sell it to the New York Times, I always tell people, try to come up with three times the number of answers that you need. If you need, a, if you need four theme answers and you've picked a theme and you can't come up with 12 possibilities so that you know that you've picked the best four, it's probably not going to fly with an editor. Um, but uh, other things, uh, you know, get on to a website called cruciverb.com. Uh, they have a lot of uh, tips and techniques that you can find there, a lot of good information, uh, a whole series of essays under what's called sage advice. So, um, it, and I think that uh, all of that's, it's either free or you get it for not much of a, of a, of a cost. Well, we have time for um, just one more question. Um, Vic, if you could answer, what is the most memorable theme of a crossword that you either constructed or wish you had constructed? Well, uh, I'm glad that, uh, yeah, that's a good question to end on. And I actually have some slides that will cover that. Uh, a friend of mine named Bruce uh, Binsky of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, and I created this puzzle for Simon & Schuster 15 years ago or so, I can't remember the exact date, but the title of this puzzle is You Be the Judge. And, uh, and it's a Schrodinger puzzle. 
And so you can see the answers that I've highlighted in yellow. Um, and, and the first four theme clues are something like 60 quotation marks, six, 60 across blank, what the lawyer says. And the lawyer winds up saying objection, incompetent, objection, immaterial, objection, irrelevant, objection, presidential. And if there's some of you in the audience of a certain age that you used to watch Perry Mason, you'll remember that Hamilton Berger had only one objection that he used in court. And he would say, Your Honor, I object. That's incompetent, immaterial, and irrelevant. And all of his objections were always overruled because Perry was getting the bad guy off because the bad guy was innocent. But then the last uh, theme answer there is objection blank, what the judge says. And of course, that's got to be objection overruled or objection sustained. But this was created in such a way that the downward clues for the key, for the crossing letters, non-winner's word could be lose or loss. A favorite of swingers could be a bat or a bar. They may barely be showing, could be BVDs or BUD, buds or BVDs, and so forth, so that uh, you could have it as objection sustained or objection overruled, and it could be both. Um, but since we're past, I want to close by reading Merle Regal's poem again. And then a crossword puzzles are a lot like life. You start out clueless. Before you know it, you pick up your first words. If you make a mistake, you learn from it. If you have a success, you build on it. You discover that everything is connected to everything else. And in the end, it doesn't matter if you have some empty spots here and there, as long as it all adds up to something. This has been fun. Thank you, guys. Oh, Vic, thank you so much. We are so grateful for you sharing all of this uh, fun knowledge. Um, and for taking the time to speak with all of us today and leading us in this conversation. I also want to extend a big thank you to the Class of 1973 Reunion Committee for sponsoring this event. Do note that this event was recorded and will be available on the website in about two weeks. Finally, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your, their night. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Vic.